Hi, yeah, my name is Tim Berglund. Um, I have uh, been known for a rather elaborate home video setup in my office. I've just moved recently and started a new job, and so I don't have that going yet. So, um, okay, I just saw a pop up on the monitor here. I'm like, you're not seeing that, are you? No, you're not good. I don't have that set up yet. So, like, my personal brand for having this overly elaborate home video setup is just completely trashed at my new job. I have, to, I have to fix that. But yeah, if you check out my YouTube channel, you can see some stuff on that. Anyway, I did just start a job at, uh, took, a, took a job at an analytics startup, which sounds like the beginning of a joke, right? Uh, why would you do a thing like that if you're a guy who likes startups? Why would you pick an analytics startup? There are some of those, right? Like, everybody wants to be the next snowflake. Um, and so th there's, there's a story, and that's kind of what this talk is about. Why on earth would I do a thing like that? Well, um, obviously, to tell that story, I'd like to start by talking about textiles, and I hope that makes sense. At least it will make sense in a minute. Um, I mean, the, the history of textiles is long, and you start with like various natural fibers and weird things like that, but you get into, in, in, particularly in Europe in the medieval period, um, once that whole kind of that technology stack gets going, um, you had uh, people spinning mostly things like wool, flax, cotton into thread and then weaving those threads into, into fabric and making mostly clothes out of those things. The limiting factor here, okay, there was a part in this process that was, that was labor intensive and expensive and it wasn't primarily the weaving, it was the spinning of thread. And so there was this very distributed industry of people. It was, as it turns out, mostly women who would do this on spinning wheels, and it was a thing that you could do when you weren't doing other things and engage in conversation, or it was a thing you could do with your hands, but your mind would be free for like talking to other people. It was kind of cool. But there was a lot of spinning that happened. Like Everybody had to spin because it was really expensive to make thread um, on these, these, uh, these spinning wheels. As it turns out, I only have a picture of the first grandson. I don't have a picture of the second grandson. But the mother of the second one has a spinning wheel in her house because she's just that kind of woman. She likes retro things. But that's a retro thing now. It's like a thing you do as a hobby. People don't spin thread anymore. So when that was industrialized, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the process of spinning thread was a thing that, that machines did. And the cost, the unit cost of a piece of thread got cheaper by many orders of magnitude, right? It was suddenly comparatively free to make thread compared to spinning. Spinning died as a thing except as what strange people like my daughter do as a hobby or in historical reenactments. I'm sorry, I'm moving my head again. That's not a supported all right, operation. Um, so like what happens when that unit cost goes down by orders of magnitude? It's 10,000 times cheaper to make a unit of thread now, so we have 10,000 times more clothing. No, all right, you don't need that. You're gonna have marginally more clothing. Okay, so it's, it's cheaper. You have a bigger wardrobe now than you would have when it was expensive to make thread, but you don't need 10,000 times more. You find different things to do with textiles, right? Like, I don't like charging cables that come wrapped in the little cloth sheath. It just bugs me. Guess what? That's too bad, because that's kind of all of them. It's sort of hard to, you can go buy the Apple one if you like spending money, and who doesn't? Um, and and that, those are just the plastic. But most, mostly, textiles are like everywhere. They're in all kinds of weird places. You don't even notice it. And that's an artifact of, of the unit cost of thread. I mean, there's a lot of things going on here, but one of the first drivers was the unit cost of thread gets cheaper. You don't do 10,000 times more of the thing you were doing. You find new things to do with that material. All right, and that is closely related to the story of analytics. Um, I like to, I just think it's obvious. I mean, there's some, la I was, some people laughed when I said that. It wasn't supposed to be a joke. Okay, so, um, and, and analytics, you know, computerized analytics uh, goes back to really the first computers, but the way we think of it, I think kind of really started in the early 90s. Um, and there's a little bit of bias there. Anytime, I'm always aware, anytime I say something started in the early 90s, like my career started in the early 90s, there's a little bit of like, well, the world began then. So, I mean, what was there? Uh, anyway, I think I'm, I think I'm, I'm mostly right here because the current, the contemporary tradition of data warehousing started around then. 
You had relational databases really kind of solidifying as the technology that ordinary people were going to build systems with. That was a new revolutionary idea um, in the late 80s, early 90s. And you had, uh, you know, the, the, the big uh, kind of thinkers in, in data warehousing getting started then. And these are all systems oriented. Or, see, I tilted my head. When am I going to learn? These are all systems. Where do you have some gaff tape? I could just, I don't. Um, uh, systems around generating reports, right? The idea was to make a report that you give to a decision maker. There are very few of these people in the organization. They're high up in the organization. They make consequential decisions. We generate a report. It was probably printed, maybe bound, and it was daily, and that was a game changer. Or it was really, really interesting technology to be able to do that. Um, and it was relatively expensive to do that. Now, it was really cool that you could gather everything that happened yesterday and make a report today, but there was this big heavyweight process that ran overnight because businesses were relatively less globalized 30 years ago than they are now, and nighttime was when nothing else was going on. You didn't have you know, stuff going on all over the world, and so you, you'd ran this process, you'd made this report, and the, the, the queries might take minutes to run, it was fine, whatever, here's your report, you're done, you give it to a decision maker. There's kind of a process where that, over time, number one, the daily has gotten to be a little bit of a bummer, maybe you'd like that to be hourly or something like that, and the, the systems, kind of the big data revolution 10, 15 years ago that, that happened then, those systems were able to do that, they didn't, they didn't need to be nightly, you could get things kind of done more on the order of hours or fractions of a day. And reporting, or the, the, whatever the analytics product is, uh, it's a reporter, it's a whatever, got pushed down the org chart into people, you can see this person on a factory floor, you know, who, who might need to know uh, roll-ups of what's going on in that physical plant to be able to make decisions about how to do his job, that guy, his, uh, you know, that person's job on the floor. So analytics gets pushed down in the org chart from, from this place, rarefied air, up where executives are, and more and more people are needing it. Now, that, of course, has happened. That's a thing. I think there's this new trend now where it's getting pushed. The analytics product isn't just interesting up and down the org chart, but outside of the organization. And that's, that's the, the, the primary sea change that I think is happening and that I would like you to understand uh, if you don't take much else away from this other than my grandson's cute. Um, the analytics product is now getting pushed outside the organization into the user interaction layer, into things that people use. And you can prove this because it's happening to you. If you ever use LinkedIn, um, you're actually using a real-time analytics database. Every single page load has got multiple queries into a real-time analytics database. And there are features. LinkedIn used to be like a site for a resume. You had your, your CV there and your contacts, and you couldn't really remember what conference you met that person at. And, you know, I'll, I'll have salespeople at work say, hey, you're connected to so-and-so. Could you maybe make me an introduction? I'm like, I have literally no idea who that person is. You know, I just, I don't know any history, and I, I wish LinkedIn would help me with that, but it doesn't. So it used to be just, here's your CV and, and your Rolodex. Uh, but it's a lot more interactive now. There's things like who viewed my profile. There's all kinds of, if you use it for hiring, neat recruiting tools, and all of those are taking the activity of the system, rolling them up, mushing them through an OLAP database, and, and pushing those results into your uh, face, I guess, really. It makes it sound rude, but um, just, just making that stuff available to, to users. And that's a, that's a key thing that's happening in... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really the, the, the present of analytics, this, mo this movement that's going on right now. So uh, maybe also a little bit of a taxonomy here to help make this a little bit more solid, what I'm talking about. Obviously, we need a quadrant. <laughs> this is not going to be solved without a quadrant. And I want to kind of uh, su suggest four categories of people. And I'm going to give you a use case here that I actually need to, I'll ask I, it's a very, I know it's a very US-centric use case. I don't know how applicable it is here, and you can tell me, but it, it, it'll be totally understandable whether the brand is a brand here or not. Anyway, uh, I'm going to have people I call analysts, people I call operators, customers, and users. And when we get into the use case, it, it'll be a little bit more concrete what those people are. But analysts traditionally are, I'm just going to say, like the executive type person, right? There are not many of them. Um, and 
uh, there, there could be, you know, on the order of tens of those people accessing our OLAP database at one time. Uh, queries might take minutes, maybe many minutes to run, so on the order of kind of 10 to the 2 seconds. And data can be on the order of hours old, and that's okay uh, for those decision makers. That's kind of expected and, and not bad these days for your basic data lake kind of situation. Um, maybe people on the factory floor, those kinds of people, um, the, you know, I have, I have a total of three typos in this slide that I just saw. It's the kind of thing I want to just stop and fix them, but I, I'm not going to fix them. Okay. Um, I, changed, I changed the formatting of a thing like a half an hour ago, and I, there's, there's three numbers that are wrong. We'll get through it. All right. Um, operators, there are more of those people, right? There are more people who might be concurrently, these are the, these are the folks on the factory floor as analysts get pushed down the org chart. Um, there could be hundreds of those kinds of people concurrently accessing the database. Uh, they want faster queries, right? Those, they're going to want things on the order of seconds and freshness also maybe on the order of minutes. That says hours there, 10 to the 3 seconds is hours, uh, but that really should be minutes. Uh, when you get to customers, these are people outside the organization now um, who are going to need really uh, a user interface that's powered by some kind of OLAP database. And I'm going to give you a use case here that makes that very concrete. But these folks need very fast queries, unusually fast, sub-second or even millisecond kind of queries, and there are potentially thousands or tens of thousands of them, and they need very fresh data. Whereas um, the, the users, this kind of mass of people everybody using the product, service, website, mobile app, whatever it is. Uh, there could be millions, tens of millions of those if it's a globally successful application. They want millisecond latency, and they're really looking at, at truly real-time freshness. Now, uh, let me break this basically into two categories. Over here, this is the received tradition of internal analytics. And when we think of analytics, we're thinking of that. Well, it started as data warehouse, then it unfortunately became a data lake or a data swamp or a data whatever thing, data, data, data shoals, data river, uh, sort of the Kafka world. I more think of, of things in terms of streams. Um, over here, this is, this is user-facing analytics. And this, again, is the primary revolution that I think is unfolding right now in the analytics world, where um, concurrency is a lot higher. Obviously, once we're exposing this to people outside the organization, hopefully, if it's a successful product or service, then there's going to be a lot more people wanting to query the thing at once, and their expectations of latency are tighter. If this is a thing in the interaction layer, in a user interface, um, it can't take five seconds for the query to run. That's kind of the story with um, you know, the current generation of the technologies that have replaced the legacy data warehouse, things like Spark SQL, uh, Presto, Trino, um, uh, oh, Snowflake, I mentioned Snowflake before in terms of a, a commercial cloud native kind of solution. These are all good things. They're going to continue to have a place in the world, and I'm not suggesting that they, they die in any way, shape, or form. But it takes five seconds to do anything in Spark SQL, right? Uh, I mean, if it's, if it's a, 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 a 10 billion rows, if it's 10,000 rows, it's like five seconds, you know? That's, and, and that's impressive, right? The kinds of things that you can get done in five seconds, but even small things take that relatively long period of time. And it's hard to power a user interface with that kind of latency. So there's now uh, 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 these, these two kind of non-functional requirements, larger, con you know, larger set of concurrent users querying the database at once, and they need answers faster. So what can we do to build this? I just mentioned uh, these guys, Spark SQL, Presto, BigQuery. I didn't mention BigQuery, but now I'm mentioning BigQuery. Um, extremely well-established tools that like everybody uses. I need to figure out how to get Excel on here or Google Sheets because that's the other real competitor for anybody who makes anything with analytics, right? It's literally Google Sheets and Microsoft Excel and it kind of works for most things um, on the, the internal facing side of the house is the reality. But um, yeah, over here you've got uh, these 
what I will call, and there is always a touch of irony these days when we say big data, but they are what happened when we were non-ironically saying big data 10 years ago. These are now those tools that have, that have uh, been passed down to us and are going concerns now. They're very flexible in that what you do is you throw SQL at them and they are more or less complete ANSI SQL implementations. You throw queries at them, they do whatever it is you want them to do. Hundreds of lines of SQL, it's fine. They'll do it, it might take minutes to run. It's not gonna take less than five seconds. That's kind of what they do. So they're relatively high latency and extremely high in flexibility. In the middle, uh, you have people trying to approximate real-time results with things like Elasticsearch. Uh, Druid is arguably in the category of real-time databases. I'm gonna give, there's really only three open source things right now that are, that are viable options for this. Druid's one of them, um, and some people try to do this with Elasticsearch. That doesn't usually work out super well in terms of latency. Elastic is for other things, not, not analytics. Um, but you're also giving up some flexibility, right? You don't have complete SQL uh, implementations or even any SQL in the case of Elastic. Uh, some people do this with uh, key value stores, right? If I say, hey, I have a tight latency requirement, I need everything to get done inside of 35 milliseconds. All right, well, you could build that in a key value store, it's gonna work fine, um, but you're gonna hate your life also, and that you don't want to hate your life because uh, you need a database and you kinda have to be the database if it's a key value store. You have to do all that on the right you have to build the values and think about the keys, and nobody wants that. You're not a database, and if you try to be one, you're, as my therapist would say, you're over-functioning, and you don't want to over-function, right? That's, that's actually hard, and there's kind of another angle on this um, in my, you know, I've spent the last five years thinking about event-driven systems and Kafka and things like that, and there's, there is this move, and this is really a separate angle from the, the analytics angle, but I mean, event-driven architecture is happening to us. We can respond to that or not, or just have it roll over, roll over us like a tidal wave. But you know, that's happening, and so there is this new data infrastructure that's pretty much Kafka. I mean, in some cases, it's Pulsar. That's, that's uh, an interesting chunk of the market, but Kafka's the default, right? But some kind of streaming platform that's helping us manage events, and we're building now you know, increasingly reactive microservices on top of this event substrate. So you've got some kind of differentiated application code up here. That's the stuff that you actually do that serves your customers. You've got, let's just call it Kafka down here, this new data infrastructure. There are still databases in various places and an interesting story there, but here's this new infrastructure. Here's your differentiated application code. It's a very different way of building an application and there's somewhere in between this is definitely infrastructure and this is definitely the code you're in the business of writing. There's this fuzzy boundary of where the infrastructure doesn't know where it wants to be yet. It's kind of creeping up the stack and, and in a good way, you know, because we've had to now write code very far down the stack, like I said with the key value store a minute ago, being the database that's a bad choice, right? It is, like Admiral Akbar says, a trap for you to, to go too far down the stack and build this stuff that it's just not your job to build. You've got customers you're trying to take care of, ideally, you're a business or whatever it is. It's not, you're not probably an infrastructure developer, and if you are, you'd know that, and you probably wouldn't be listening to me uh, talk about this. But, so yeah, the, 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 the kind of the Kafka end of things here is trying to figure out how far up the stack it should grow and what of this big chunk of code we're writing right now really should be richer infrastructure so that we can stick to just the differentiated stuff that's interesting and serves people and, and uh, is, is different when you do it for your company versus a competitor does it for theirs. If you're a database or if you're a Kafka, well, that's the same no matter what. It's just, it's, it's, it's just infrastructure, right? So um, one of the things these real-time analytics databases are trying to be is, in a sense, making Kafka queryable. And there are already ways of doing that, right? There are things like Kafka Streams and KSQL DB and things like that out in the world. But um, Apache Pinot, which is a technology I work with, um, 
That's, that's sort of the cutesy two-word way of describing it. It's not helpful until you've had like a 45-minute way of describing it, but after that 45-minute, you're like, yeah, it is kind of query little Kafka, that's cool. Anyway, so don't do this with a key value store. That was just me taking like eight minutes to say that's a bad idea. What you actually need is something that can ingest data at a high rate. You want to be able to plan for scale. Now, most of us aren't Netflix, and we need to keep that in mind. Um, with their stock price right now, that's, you're probably happy you're not Netflix, right? Of course, well, I don't know if you work for a public company, if anybody's happy with what their stock price is right now. Sore topic. But um, you need to be able to plan for scale. And so a database that can ingest events at a high rate is a good thing. Uh, you need to be able to scale horizontally. Um, millisecond query latency, and that's not necessarily single digit milliseconds, but to power a user interface, uh, on the order of tens of milliseconds is a query latency that we want to be able to achieve. And you'd like it to be SQL, right? There's just no reason to, to, to pretend. We tried. Uh, we did. It was, it was, I was there, OK? I was reading the posts on Hacker News at my breakfast table 2010 every morning. It was, a, it was summer, I remember. There would be like some new and differently uninformed post about the cap theorem on somebody's blog. It was a dark time. If, if, you, were, if, you, were, if you were there, you know. Uh, and we tried to say, we don't need SQL for our databases anymore. It's just not true. It's never true. We do. And anytime we try to get away, we come back. So we would like something that, uh, uh, that, that gets us there and that, that is just a database with a tabular data model and SQL. Wouldn't that be nice? So that's what um, things like Druid and ClickHouse and Apache Pinot, which is technology I'm working with now, uh, it's what they do. They are real-time analytics databases. All right, um, some things you can do with this. Uh, Pinot came to life from LinkedIn, and um, you know that LinkedIn tends to generate some interesting data infrastructure. Kafka came from LinkedIn. Uh, and that same group, a few years later, realized they had a need to be able to, like I said, make Kafka queryable. And so they built Pinot. And they, they built it because there were some, some features that LinkedIn was trying to develop. Again, it was a resume site and a, a Rolodex, and that's not very exciting. You'd go there like once a month to see what weird unsolicited contact requests you've gotten, or maybe update something in your resume. Uh, but you didn't go there any, any, any more than that. So they needed to build interactive features like, oh, my inner narcissist would like to see who's viewed my profile. I'll go back there five times a day for that. That's cool. Uh, and that's, that's real-time data. So to be able to do that, they needed infrastructure that they didn't have. The feed is informed by Pinot queries. So if somebody you know has interacted with a post even a second ago, then you load the page that's more likely, that, that post is more likely to show up in your feed. If you just viewed a, a post and then you refresh the page, well, you just viewed it so it's less likely to be visible to you now. So again, these are real-time things that are happening, that are, that are actual Pinot queries happening under the covers. Um, Uber Eats, this is the use case I wanted to get to. And is this, it, I mean, I know the brand, everybody knows Uber, but is Uber Eats a brand that is meaningful? Around here, yes, no, okay. The per per people who are saying no are people who don't do meal delivery, and I see you. Um, I, don't, I just, I was, I was sick in January, and uh, actually COVID in January, and I needed some food delivered, and I'm like, it was forty dollars U.S. dollars for a hamburger. I just don't know why I would do that. But Uber Eats, anyway. Apparently, it's a thing here. Um, as a user, in my taxonomy, that was the. Uh, would have been quadrant one, the last one we, we got to. Um, as a user, you want to know things like, how long is it going to take for this restaurant to deliver a meal to me? Well, that's, a, that's an analytics query, right? That's a real-time analytics query. It can't take five seconds to generate that result. That's not going to be interesting. I want that to show up in the UI right away so this thing looks like a living, breathing application. The restaurant manager, these were the customers that people would have been in the fourth quadrant. Um, now, if I'm running a restaurant, I also have an interface into what's going on, like what's my order volume right now? Is there a rush happening on some meal? Can I understand why? Do I need to prepare or alter the operation in my restaurant within the next five minutes because of this thing that happened a few minutes ago? And things like delivery time, 
uh, as, a, as a hungry hamburger eating person, um, that's important to me that that data be up to date because during a rush, if it's like quarter to six in the evening, that might be changing a lot and I might be really hungry, but you know, if lots of people are going to Smashburger to my Smashburger right now, then it might go from 20 minutes to, to 40 minutes, the delivery time, that, that could easily, that kind of delivery latency could change in a matter of minutes, so it's important that the data be fresh. Oops, there we are. Um, yeah, so like I said, there are three real contenders in this space. Now, I made the joke at the start of the talk that saying I recently went to work for an analytics startup, to me, does sound like the beginning of a stand-up set. Um, like you're gonna be making some kind of self-deprecating joke, like why would you do that? Um, and in, in my line of work in developer relations, sometimes I talk to like early stage founders of companies that are like, how do we do this DevRel thing? And, and yet yeah, most of them are analytics companies. So there's a lot of this going on. There really are, I think, to a first order approximation, only three players currently in the real time space. And those are called ClickHouse, Druid, and Pinot. Um, so again, Pinot is the one I'm focused on. Here are some logos. That's cool. Um, there's a, a great Slack workspace that you should 100% join. There's a QR code at the end, so don't worry about taking a picture of that. I'll get you there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's got a, a robust and hopefully increasingly robust community around it. Let's talk about how it works. Um, this is kind of interesting because it's fun to look at how it works. It can be important for you to know how it works if it's a thing you deploy and run. Um, in, the f in the future, you know, increasingly data infrastructure is a thing you run in the cloud if you can, right? You don't wanna deploy this distributed system that's got all these moving parts. And Pinot is it's, it's kinda complicated as a, as a distributed system, so hopefully there'll be uh, good viable cloud services you can use. But there's some source of events out in the world. Uh, in most cases, that's Kafka, right? Pinot usually lives where Kafka lives. It doesn't need to. You can actually ingest data from a static place like uh, a bunch of parquet files in S3 or something, or some, some, some sad uh, data lake where there's algae growing and mosquitoes and the fish have died. <laughs> Nobody knows why. But um, let's just say it's, it's probably Kafka. Um, there are uh, these things called Pino servers, and believe it or not, that is not just in general a uh, thing, but that's like one of the components is called the server, and we named that, that ourselves. Um, Pino servers are where data is kept. That's where data is, is kept in units called segments. Segments are just partitions of tables. Again, from a developer standpoint, the, the data model is tabular. You see tables. Pino stores those as segments. Uh, Pinot is also a column database, so that's an implementation detail that you don't care about unless you care about it, um, but data is, is stored in these run length encoded uh, a, a column uh, at a time, uh, which is typical of, of uh, databases that are optimized for OLAP or for analytics purposes. Okay, so these servers are storing segments, and uh, they can be constantly consuming real-time segments, or there can be segments that are there uh, that, are, that are imported from static sources. Uh, then there is uh, another set of machines called the brokers. These are both uh, sets that are horizontally scalable, right? I can, I can independently horizontally scale my brokers and my servers, depending on whether I'm scaling uh, data or compute. So brokers are taking queries from clients and scattering them to the servers where the data lives, and then gathering the results and turning them into a unified result set, since you're gonna have to do that scatter-gather because you've got partitions, little partitions of tables all over the place. Um, there is a machine called the controller. There's a zookeeper cluster, because there pretty much always has to be a zookeeper cluster. Maybe in five years, we'll all be talking about getting rid of Zookeeper from Pino, who knows? I mean, that was big news in the Kafka world over the last three years. Um, it's not a trivial thing, but every engineer kind of wants to write 
their own raft implementation, right? So there's like always internal pressure from the engineering team because who doesn't want to do that? And also operationally, um, nobody ever seems to be delighted that Zookeeper is present. So hey, who knows what'll happen in the future? But there you go, that's kind of the basic architecture. You got the controller, Zookeeper, that's storing metadata. Brokers are really brokering queries to the servers and uh, gathering the data, or gathering results back together, sending them back to uh, clients. What are the clients? The clients are probably not dashboards, all right? The clients can be dashboards. I don't hate dashboards. I don't hate them at all. Uh, they are what reports have become. Uh, they're just like if you, you had reports and then you stopped wanting to print things and you wanted to put them in a browser tab, well, then that's a dashboard, right? And that's a, that's a better evolution of what a report is. Um, the, the focus of the dashboard is the internal decision maker. And there is not a thing in the world about any of the real-time distributed data, uh, uh, databases, uh, analytics databases that I've, mentioning, that I've mentioned. There's not a thing in the world about Pinot that makes it unsuitable for powering a dashboard. It's fine. It's just that, man, there's already a lot of people doing that. And there really isn't anybody powering, again, the interaction layer. So what is the client? Where are those queries coming from? Probably an application that somebody like us writes. Think of the Uber Eats app calculating delivery time, not calculating, issuing a query to some dang database to tell me for the restaurants inside this geofence uh, of this type matching these criteria over the last five minutes or over the last hour, what's been the average delivery time? Give me that. Here's result set. JDBC result set comes back if you're writing in Java. It can actually just be JDBC. So it just looks like a database. It does that work for you and it gets you that in something that looks like real time. We don't need to talk about ingestion because um, we also barely even need to talk about the data model. I already said it's tables. That's one of the, the funny things about Pino and like demonstrating it and, and explaining it from an API standpoint. I'm like, hey, it's got tables. You have rows and you have columns and the columns have types. And here's a list of the types that are supported. Like, okay, that's cool. You know, oh, you have integers, oh, good. <laughs> oh, you have a text type, that's cool. You know, so um, it, it, again, it is not a particularly exciting data model and that's a good thing, right? You, there's not much to learn. Um, you know, the query language, nope. Not gonna tell you what SQL is, folks, you already know. Uh, important right now at the current uh, version 0 0.10, there's very limited join support. Uh, that is a thing that's growing quickly. So the kind of the vision is to have full join support in a small amount of time. Right now, uh, that's fairly simple the way that works. So you will see some, some people building systems here that look a little uh, reminiscent of the Lambda architecture where they'll have uh, Pino serving certain kinds of real-time queries, but then when you need basically full ANSI SQL and arbitrarily nested joins and all that kind of thing. They'll maybe have a Trino cluster or um, um, a Presto or something like that that's doing that full ANSI SQL in a slower way. So you have the, the 50 millisecond query from Pino and then sometimes they need to do the joins and so here's the five or the 10 millisecond query happening in, in, in Presto. Uh, so that is a thing that is happening right now, sadly reminiscent of uh, Lambda architecture, but um, likely to uh, likely to change as Pina's joint support grows. So yeah, query language is SQL. That's all we need to say about that. The fun, I think, is in the indexes, all right? Um, Pino is different from other analytics databases, as I said, in terms of two key non-functional requirements, query latency and concurrency, right? You can have lots more queries happening and they get answered faster. At least they can be answered faster. I mean, it's SQL, so you can do things that are painful and take a long time. But it's possible to get practical queries that are answered in, in, in 50 milliseconds. Um, and that's what makes it different and suitable for this, this new outwardly facing analytics mode that I'm arguing we're getting into. Um, and you can deep dive on segments, and here's how segments are broken down, and here's blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's, it's kind of, it actually is kind of interesting, the way all that works, and there's this deep store where data can be written off like to S3, 
and then sucked back into the servers when you need it. And, and it is all like worth talking about. And you know, a year from now, dev.startree.ai will have great videos explaining how all this works with cool animations. You kind of have my word on that. But I think what is actually the kind of the, the meat of what makes a data store interesting is how you read it, and that is indexes, right? It kind of comes down to how is this data indexed? Um, it starts in Pino with a thing called the forward index, which is really just if you give me a document ID or you know a unique row identifier, uh, I'll show you where uh, in the segment that row is. Okay, cool, that's a start, right? You wouldn't want to use that too much, but that's like lookup by primary key. The thing is, you can build indexes arbitrarily on any of your columns. Again, it, it acts just like a database. So you've got this set of about a dozen interesting index types, um, like there's an inverted index, which you use for uh, indexing by terms. So if you've got, say, a short text field, and you want to tokenize that, and you want to find all of the rows where uh, the word burger appears, because I must be hungry, I keep talking about burgers. No, it's because Uber Eats is this use case, and I always think of burger delivery. But yeah, you want to find all the rows where the word burger appears, you'd use an inverted index for that. That's a, that's a kind of index. You can do range queries with the sorted index. Uh, this will arrange documents in a way based on that key, such that I can say, well, from this ID to this ID, they are here, and I can quickly get those things back, um, those, those rows back uh, as a ranged set. There is a JSON index. So I have arbitrarily nested JSON. I can query that without thinking about it too much. I can do interesting JSON queries, and those queries will perform like you'd expect them to, like those, those nested bits of JSON are um, indexed. And so you see here, that's pretty small text up there, but um, you have that JSON match function on the column person string which is the JSON field, and I've got that expression where I'm indexing into an array, taking a subfield of the element that's indexed in there. I get to do that stuff, and that stuff performs well. Kind of the, the crowning glory, uh, oh no, there's a, there's a geospatial index too. Um, Uber being one of the main contributors to open source Pino, I mean, they kind of care about where things are, fundamentally a, a geospatial business. So uh, they've helped contribute the geospatial index, and there's this thing, now you know, I don't know if I said the name of the company I work for, it's called StarTree. Now you know that is an implementation detail that has leaked into the interface. StarTree is the name of probably the coolest index that, that does the, the niftiest benchmarky things in Pinot. Um, it is just a kind of index. I think it's okay though, because like, uh, Pino's got this pluggable index architecture. That's why there's all these index types and, and people contribute new ones. And five years from now, maybe nobody will care about the star tree index. Maybe that'll be the old stupid one and everybody uses the supernova index or whatever. Um, and will still be called star tree, but it won't matter because it's still a cool name. Uh, it's a good enough name that nobody needs to know except you that this was an implementation detail that leaked. But basically what a star, the star tree index is, is like if you pers persisted a pivot table to disk. So you're going to have you know, some number of dimensions uh, upon which you are, you are filtering and computing aggregates. So you've got this matrix, uh, n-dimensional matrix of aggregates that you're computing. The star tree index builds that into a tree and persists the pre-computed aggregates. So that's the cool thing. Um, so you, get, you just get funky benchmark results before and after a star tree index that look like something must be broken. It can't be that fast. That's kind of the way people react to it. We did a meetup last week with um, WebEx, uh, Cisco WebEx, and um, their, their, their Pinot users. They did this interesting bake-off a bunch among a, a, a number of options. And they did it without using star tree indexes because they thought that would be cheating because it's just too good. I'm like, well, I, I don't know. I mean, it's like a product feature. You can do it. It's this open source thing that does this thing. Seems fair to me. But they actually did the testing without that index even being enabled, because it, it did, it did uh, feels like a hack. So anyway, the, um, if, you, if, you, if you would like to learn more, 
uh, there is a website, it is dev.startree.ai, that's got recipes and tutorials and all that kind of stuff. There's pinot.apache.org, that also has lots of docs. Um, there are various videos that we're working on that kind of explain this stuff in more detail. But the key thing is, this is all kind of new, right? Um, this is a different way of thinking about analytics. And I started with that analogy of textiles, and I said, you know, when the, the unit cost decreases by a few orders of magnitude, you don't do the thing a few orders of magnitude more. You don't have 10,000 suits. Uh, that's just a bad idea for anybody. Um, so we don't have more dashboards now. Uh, there is no reason to serve more dashboard data that much more often than we do. Instead, what we want to do is a different kind of thing with analytics queries, and that is serving them to users, building application features that are extracting value from you know, the data in the business and pushing that to the people that we're normally giving just application features to. So application features that are powered by analytics is uh, probably a good idea. And there, are, there is an increasingly compelling list of companies that are doing that in ways that still feel kind of exploratory and a little bit leading edge -y. So it's a new idea, but something that I think you should think about. And you should take a picture of that. Another great way to learn more is to join our Slack workspace and ask questions. So with that, I thank you for your time. <laughs>